So the last time I spoke at a full Brexit meeting, some of the comments I made caused uh, a bit of an uproar among much of the Liberal left, and it was a bit of a sign pointing at a lot of the things that Morris has just explained. In recent times, there's been a lot of uh, quotes from people that I found interesting. There's been a couple of things said by various people. But some of the most uh, uh, clear, I thought, were from the other side. I mean, you had Rhys Mogg. I don't speak Latin, but he made a very pertinent point. I had to Google what, actually what uh, the Latin phrase meant. He said, uh, the principle that the people in this country will live under the laws made by people that they've elected is the sin qua non, is that right? Sin qua non of our departure. And I couldn't help thinking it's the sin qua non of our departure at all, because it's seen us right out of Parliament, and it's left us in bad shape, because we failed to grasp that, and it's been something people have been arguing for a very long time. The abandonment by the left in stages of defending the nation-state uh, and, uh, uh, and self-organisation and democracy has been a catastrophic failure, and it's been a long time creeping. Uh, there's been a few people that have made different analyses. So you've seen Rebecca Long-Bailey had a sort of a half-hearted stab at trying to say, you know, we've got to have a progressive patron, but it's patriotism. But it came across as false. It didn't seem very genuine. And all it did was get a lot of people excited to say, you know, opposite things or things in favour and all the rest. John McDonnell um, has given the, the, the most funny response, I think, out of a lot. And I've got, to, I've got to get it for you because it's just so strange. He says, where we went, went wrong is that we failed to develop a strategy to deal with the new era of finance data media complex. <laughs> what? Now, hang on. He says, uh, this new, I've got to read it again, the finance data media complex is a new combination of you know, capital, finance capital and everything else with its ability to use and influence the new types of media that are out there. And he says, what we failed to do is to develop grassroots new platforms uh, to fight the culture war. And, and that led me to think a few things about that. Number one, the very last thing we need in this country is a Labour Party on social media fighting the culture war. Because for a start, whose culture are they going to be fighting on behalf of? It's certainly not going to be working class culture, we know that. And when you think of new media platforms fighting a culture war, the only thing that pops into my head is the likes of Navarra Media. Yeah, so I can't see how that's a step anywhere, but further along the road uh, of irrelevance in working class areas and working class communities. Now, there's a couple of other stories. On the question of culture, my old man, when he came over here in the late 50s, he had to wait six months working bars to go and see a fella in West London to get his ticket to go and work on a ship. He couldn't set foot on a ship without his union card. You know, even as late as the 70s, I know people, for example, in, elect in an electrician's trade, who, when they came to a new area, they'd have to go and see their branch, and there'd be a ledger book this size, and they'd open it up, and they'd say, no, there's nothing left in this area, mate, there's only enough work here for us, you'll have to go on to the next place. There was places where you would turn up, you'd have 120, 150 strong meetings, where in the branch meetings at a local trade union, at the end of it, people would dole out the work to the casual, people who wanted to work casual on a Saturday. That was a trade union culture, and it was the understanding that if you go to work, you need your union ticket. When I went to work, it was completely different. I'd spent most of my life working in non-unionised industries and places. And when I came to the railway, it was the first place that was unionised, and you realise that you have got a say in the world around you in the places that you work. Most people coming into industry now don't even have that awareness. They really turn up at work. When we get new people joining, for example, in London Underground, it's not just they turn around and go, hello, these are really good terms and conditions and everything else. But they notice very early on, it's a complete culture change. They don't have to accept an app that tells them whether they're working today or not. They don't get a text to tell them whether they've got a shift. They don't have to lick their manager's ass to get a bit of work. Uh, and they've actually got a say in the surroundings that are around them. And that is a culture that we need to bring back. Now, it's not going to happen, I don't think, by messing about with the Labour Party. And I've said this... Uh, recently, I, you know, it's not nice, but the Labour Party, as far as I can see it, is irrelevant now for at least a decade, uh, and that's the cold truth of it. I can't see them coming back into power. And the problem we face is, and I've been saying this to people in my trade union who don't quite believe me, but I think Morris pointed out very clearly, this Conservative Party is going to be different to any Conservative Party that we've experienced private previously. This Conservative Party is going to try to consolidate and make a home in the Conservative Party for working class people that have left the Labour movement. 
that have seen their industries go under neoliberalism, that have seen their institutions go. They've no longer got the trade union uh, around them. They've no, no longer got those institutions through which they could be educated and make their you know, grievances with society at large known and, and you know, shaped in ways that make sense. That's all gone. So they're gonna, at the same time, they're gonna attack the actual uh, institutions of the working class, like my union, they're coming for immediately uh, with trying to implement minimum service levels and all the rest of it. They're going to try and destroy the institutions that exist, the, uh, the original working class self-organisations. They're going to be attacked, but at the same time there's going to be a different offer. So we've got to be savvy to that. And in my view, the best work, well, what I'm going to be engaging over the coming, coming period, is we have to rebuild that. And when you think about the trade union movement, we've got to recognise there's a lot of it that is in bad shape. It's not fit for purpose. Uh, I'm in from an industrial trade union, and you know, without going into the uh, minutiae trade union organisation and boring everyone to death with trade union theory, it's a very important thing to have a couple of principles at the heart of the trade union movement, and that is, there is nobody in a trade union who can make a decision that isn't an actual worker. So you don't have a load of people who are from university who join a trade union structure somewhere and end up in leadership positions and are somehow dictating what goes on. And that also that any decision that's made by a trade union can be challenged by every member of it. And that's how my union functions. And a lot of people think the RMT and its milit militancy arose from us electing Bob Crow, which was a, you know, a fantastic general secretary. He came to power in our trade union off the back of a campaign to democratise, democratise the union we, we have. And that's the reason why we're militant. And that's the reason why you see us stopping trains when they sack our members and why you see us fighting. It's because we're democratic. And the people that actually make the decisions are the workers employed in those industries. And it's my view that's got to be reflected throughout the trade union movement. There's going to have to be a challenge in the trade unions to change things and make things better. Uh, and that's going to be resisted. You know, if you, we're, we're coming up to 150 years in existence. We're coming up to a 100-year anniversary of the first national rail strike. And when I look back at some of the things that was going on then, there was a rank-and-file movement around in the trade unions at that time that wanted to... You know, a lot of people got problems with the TUC, me included, but they wanted to centralise power in the general council of the TUC in order to have the TUC or the trade union movement act as or in the interest of the entire class. So when we've got a tax on us, there's a response. And, you know, that can work. If you look at France, you've only got to take your hat off to the CGT to see the days and days and days and days of strike action they've progressed in. They've seen ministers fall out of the French government. They've been given offers, I'll tell you what, if you've got those types of offers in this country, the TUC will be running 200 miles an hour at them to take it off of them. Uh, but they're resisting, they're saying, no, we're not going to settle for anything less than the demands that we've set out for. So that shows what can happen when you've got some real class organisation. And it's through that type of organisation, I think, that culture will change. Because, you know, throughout my time in a trade union, I've stood on picket lines with all kinds of you know, people. I've been uh, on picket lines with stalwart members of my union, one of which was a former, uh, uh, a f a former serviceman from the Navy, who seemed, you know, happy to seek the Belgrano and all that, but you couldn't get wild horses to drag him across the picket line. You know, so there's all of this going on out there, and the only way I think to bring people back together is to start back in the places where we work, because that's the only place where we can get past all the divisions in society. Most of the left, or what's left of it, all these liberal different factions, uh, for want of a better way of putting them, they're going to be engaged over the next period in absolutely pointless culture war arguments. Uh, you know, it's going to be identity politics, it's going to be all of this kind of nonsense. They're going to be screaming at Boris, left, right and centre. And meanwhile, most working class people, or a significant uh, number of them, are just turned off to it. They're not listening anymore. Uh, and that's the danger. The only way we can get people back and engaged in their own culture, I think, is through rebuilding the trade unions. So that's what I'm going to be doing over the next period.